So, uh, Terraform, and also TerraGrunt. Uh, so, as before we start, um, anybody using Terraform actively? Or TerraGrunt? Oh, one person, cool. Um, now, is anybody using any other um, infrastructure as code language? Cloud formation, uh, whatever Azure uses, I don't even know. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if you don't know, so Terraform is a infrastructure as code tool, and what that means is basically what you would normally do in in front of a terminal, say configuring your infrastructure, creating networks, creating servers. Um, instead of doing that manually, you're going to write code that then determines what infrastructure is deployed, and that happens automatically when you run your code. So just like you would deploy an application, you would now deploy your code, your uh, infrastructure code, as if it's an application, and that uh, that gets you your um, creates your infrastructure. So Terraform is open source. Um, it's developed by a company called uh, HashiCorp, and it's written in Go. Um, it uses the HashiCorp configuration language, which is their own sort of devised markdown. Not really markdown. It's sort of a, a markup language. Um, it's sort of like half between JSON and YAML. It's got some curly braces, but uh, it's not it's not white space uh, sensitive. So it's it's actually not too bad to use um, once you get used to it. Uh, and now with uh, Terraform 12 or 12 0 0.12 that they've released, uh, they've made some improvements. They are calling it uh, HCL 2.0. Uh, they've made some syntax changes. Uh, it's a lot. It's less. Uh, verbose, you need a lot less brackets and things, so it, it's pretty easy to type now. It's not too bad. So Terraform is plat platform agnostic, and what that means is that it doesn't matter. It can deploy to multiple different platforms. And when I say um, platform or provider, what I'm talking about is things like uh, AWS or Azure, or if you're talking on-prem, things like uh, Red Hat OpenShift uh, or OpenStack. Basically, any any platform that provides an API that allows you to uh, make calls to the platform and perform actions through that API, you can automate it through Terraform. And uh, Terraform supports lots of different platforms, so uh, chances are the platform you're looking for uh, is supported in at least some sense, and then uh, you can expand on that yourself if you want to. Uh, so as I mentioned, infrastructure is code. So it's basically, it's part of the DevOps paradigm uh, of infrastructure management. Uh, and it's treating infrastructure as if it's application code. So the same way that you write an application and you version it and you deploy it, you do a set deployment um, pipeline, things like that, uh, you can do with your Terraform code for your infrastructure. So you're not making little piecemeal changes uh, here and there. You're maintaining all of your infrastructure basically as a code base the same way you would as an application and then you're maintaining it similar to that. And so when you have it in code, you're able to use uh, revision control systems like Git or SVN, where if you want to make a change to your application, the first thing you do is you commit it to your change control. And if there's anything that goes wrong with that infrastructure change, you misdeploy it or you, uh, you deploy something and it doesn't work, to roll back, all you do is pull your last revision from revision control and you redeploy your infrastructure back to its previous state. So you didn't need to, you didn't need to go in and write down what state your infrastructure was in before you touched it, you already know because you saved all of your infrastructure in your revision control. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then as a result of that, the infrastructure is self-documenting. So instead of saying, hey, what's the IP of that server? Let me log into the server and find out what IP is on it. Well, I can just look at the code and say, oh, well, this server was deployed with this IP address. So now I know what the IP address of that server is. Do I really need to then copy that into another data repository of or inventory management, perhaps, depending on how your environment runs? Or you can just say all of the details of that server are already saved in, in revision control, and if you need any details for that system, well, just go look up the code that deployed it. So onto TerraGrunt. So TerraGrunt is a wrapper for the Terraform executable. It's actually quite simple. Uh, you really don't notice it once you've got it set up. Um, basically, it runs the Terraform command for you, and you just run TerraGrunt. So you run TerraGrunt, it runs Terraform. Uh, it shows you basically exactly what it's doing with Terraform, and it's just sort of filling in some of the gaps 
that the native Terraform tool does. And I'll cover some of those um, with Terraform uh, 12. So I didn't make a history slide, but there's basically been one major change in Terraform since its creation. Uh, so they've been, they're not at a 1.0 release yet. They're still doing, you know, the zero dot whatever. Um, and the change from 0.11 to 0.12 realistically should have been a major number change. Um, but since they're not calling it 1.0, they're kind of stuck because what are they going to do? Like 0.1.12 or whatever. So they basically just, they just incremented another number. But the change from Terraform 0.11 to 0.12 was a breaking change. So most of the code written for 0.11 is not compatible with .12, you run into some syntax errors uh, that you have to go in and change. And they have some automated migration tools that help, but um, pretty much for us uh, in our .11 code base, we had to pretty much go through it by hand and, and sort of pick out everything that needed to be updated for version 12. So Terra Grunt is managed by a company called Gruntworks. And the idea of Gruntworks is that um, they're performing or they're re they're pre-creating uh, a lot of the um, simple Terraform code that is basically grunt work. So things that, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's just grunt work. So you shouldn't have to come up with basic network designs or basic server deploy Terraform. Uh, so the company Gruntworks basically sells these modules in a, uh, as a service to companies. And those are all based off of using the TerraGrunt tool. But the Terra Grant tool itself is actually open source. They release the source code for that to anybody who wants to download it. And it also works with plain Terraform code that you write yourself. So you can use uh, their modules or you can write it all from scratch, uh, depending on what you want to do. They do have some nice pre-made modules where uh, you can save you know, a week worth of figuring out how to do something. They just already have a pre-written module that does pretty much everything you need to do. And as I said, virtually transparent after initial configuration. Um, I don't think I've ever actually typed the Terraform command on its own. Uh, right from the get-go, I've been using TerraGrunt, and you don't even notice that you're not using Terraform, vice versa. Uh, even aside from very odd little bugs that I've ran into, um, you'll never not be looking at Terraform problems. You'll never really need to go to the TerraGrunt documentation because it's so transparent. So when we talk about infrastructure as code, well, now we need to maintain a code repository of all of our infrastructure. So how do we lay that out in a manner that actually makes sense? Uh, and this is practice recommended by Gruntworks, and this is also um, public information from their uh, repos. And so what they recommend is you have two, two top-level folders. One of them is called your live directory, and one of them is called your modules directory. So your live folder is going to contain all of the input data that you've provided to your environment. So that's where all of your actual um, self-documenting information is because that's where you're providing all of the input data saying, you know, this network is going to have this IP address and this server is going to have this IP address and all of that. Uh, it's all going to be represented in the live folder code. Now in your modules folder, uh, that's where you're going to actually write the Terraform code that's going to deploy resources based on the input data that it's getting from live. And I'll show you how the two of them work together and how you sort of separate them. And the advantage of that is it allows your modules to be fully reusable across environments. So it decouples the deployment data from the Terraform deployment resources that it's going to deploy. So you can take, once you write a module that says, uh, you know, deploy a VPC with six networks and route tables and blah, blah, blah. Well, if you want uh, a dev environment, a QA environment, and a prod environment, you only write the module once. And so in your modules folder, you only have that one module written. But in your live folder, you're going to have three copies of information. You're going to have your prod deployment, your QA deployment, and your dev deployment, all with unique information that you've provided. But all of those use the same module. So that's where it allows you to reuse module code. Uh, you don't have to rewrite everything every time. Yeah. Are the modules a function of TerraGrunt, or are they something that's viable with Terraform? Everything, 99% of what I'm going to show you is natively Terraform. So TerraGrunt is, provides some syntactic sugar? And yeah. Yeah, I'll show you that specifically uh, once I get to some of the code examples, uh, because it's actually quite subtle what it fills in. Okay. Um, but it does make a difference, and it's nice to have. So. Um, for the 
for the small amount of effort it, it takes to configure Terra Grunt, uh, in my opinion, it's worth it. And that's what I've been using since the beginning. So for me, it's definitely easier just to stick with it. So as I mentioned, Terraform is platform agnostic. And part of that is based around the idea of providers. And so the providers are what actually abstract each unique platform's functionality into common calls for Terraform to perform. Now, when I've, the very first time I heard of Terraform, I heard it as, oh, Terraform is uh, platform agnostic and it allows a common code set to deploy to multiple platforms. And I thought, wow, so they actually went through the effort to completely abstract every function of the providers and provide a common, uh, a common deployment for each, for each one, you know, you say, oh, well, I want to deploy a server and it's going to figure out, well, what's the AWS version of a server? What's the Azure version of a server? Um, unfortunately, that's not actually the case. Um, once you look into it, it is uh, agnostic in the sense that they support multiple platforms. But unfortunately, each platform has its own provider and each provider has unique resources that correspond to that platform. So if you want to you, if you want to deploy to AWS, you would be using an AWS provider, and that provider has specific resources for AWS. And if you wanted to deploy to Azure, then you would have to use the Azure uh, provider, and that would also have unique resources. They might look very similar, um, but they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily mapping one to one. So when you're moving between platforms, you basically have to maintain uh, code for both platforms if you want to, if you want to do both at the same time. Pretty much impossible, most likely, yeah, with the differences. Um, but even the, the level of abstraction that is there, it is a common configuration language between all the different platforms. And so to go between deploying on AWS or Azure, it's the exact same syntax. It's literally just different names on your resources. Uh, and you just have to look up the reference document on, okay, how do I, what's the parameter for the IP address for Azure and what's it for AWS? Um, but the, the the style that you write it is going to be exactly the same. So it would grease the transition if you wanted to go from one to the other, it would do all four. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, your code would look exactly the same. It would just be different names on most of your resources. So the providers are the ones that are determining your API calls to each platform, uh, and they they figure it all out. You don't have to say, well, here's the API URL for AWS, or here's the one for Amazon or for uh, Azure. Uh, they already know it's programmed in. Uh, you don't have to provide any of that. You just say what your provider is, whether it's Amazon, Azure, and it uh, pulls it in. And so the providers are maintained independently of the Terraform core application. So this is especially handy because each platform uh, releases new features at different rates, and the Terraform core app release schedule might be quite different than what you need for some of these platforms that are moving very fast. And so the way that they've done it is they've decoupled the provider from Terraform, the Terraform core app. And that allows them to push updates to the provider extremely quickly, and it's maintained essentially by different sets of people, different community groups um, between each other. So if AWS releases a new, uh, a new feature or a new product, um, it might only take a week before the AWS provider is updated to provide uh, the deploy capability to that new feature. Um, but at the same time, there have been cases where you need something in the provider and it's six months away because nobody feels like doing it. Um, I've run into some of those where uh, AWS has released a new feature and, oh yeah, well, it's going to be out in four months or so. Uh, just keep checking this GitHub issue page and uh, we'll let you know when it's ready. Of course, you can always write it yourself, uh, but that is something that I have run into that occasionally the community does fall behind uh, on certain things and then you're, uh, you're sort of stuck if you don't want to write it yourself. <laughs> You know, it's funny, even Amazon suffers from the same thing with their own language. Uh, there have been several times where I, I've heard that CloudFormation itself is behind on AWS features for their own platforms. You can't even use their own language to deploy to their own platform. So no one is immune to that. So as I mentioned, uh, HCL is HashiCorp configuration language. Um, they now have version 2.0, what they're calling it, uh, with Terraform 12 or dot 12. Um, so the basics of HCL is you've got basically blocks or stanzas 
uh, that define resources and their variables. So each, each resource you can think of it as an individual code block, um, and it's got its individual properties that you'll define, and I'll show you some of those in the uh, examples. And the majority of what you'll be doing is basically key pair values. So you'll define a resource. Resource has X number of properties, uh, which you input as keys, and then each one of those keys has a value. So you might have server name equals blah, server IP equals blah, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you're basically just defining properties of all of these resources. You're not doing a lot of, um, there's no big uh, for loops or, uh, or data structures or anything like that. You're really just um, doing configuration blocks, and there is some logic handling within that. So it does have some basic data types, um, and those include booleans, uh, number, string, lists, and maps. Uh, so list is basically your standard array, um, and then map is a um, key value pair uh, array. And one thing to remember, uh, or to take note of, when you're looking at these data types, is at the end of the day, all of this data is calls to an API. And APIs, especially specifically REST APIs, typically don't associate data types with their input data. So even though you have, uh, say, a Boolean or a number data, uh, data object that you're trying to pass to the API, at the end of the day, it's ending up as a string most of the time. And Terraform is normally smart enough to figure that out, um, especially in uh, .12, they've gotten a lot better about that. Um, so if you if you read the API reference from Amazon, it will tell you, well, if you want to send us a Boolean, you have to literally send us the string false or the string true. And so Terraform is smart enough that if you pass it a real Boolean value that you can perform logic on, it will then convert that to a string when it makes the API call to Amazon. But um, in the past, that wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah. Uh, so you just said uh, it's smart enough to figure out basically Boolean true so that it can do the translation to a string so that you can do logic. What logic can you do? You can do basic if statements in your Terraform code. So you can say uh, if value equals, if, if variable equals true, you know, do X. Um, and then you can, so you can say that you might have an, um, an AWS resource that says, uh, assign public IP. And so that would be a Boolean input, uh, except it's not actually in the API, it's not a Boolean, it's just a string of true or false. So if you pass a variable in Terraform with a literal Boolean true, it will then convert that to a string when it makes the API call. So there are for loops, but there are if There are basic for loops, um, which I don't have a demo of because I, um, I haven't had a chance to use any of them yet. Uh, those were specifically introduced in uh, Terraform 12. Yeah. Uh, and then there's also uh, something called interpolation syntax, which uh, ironically uses the uh, bash style um, string escapes uh, for variables. And the interpolation syntax is mostly unneeded in Terraform 12. Uh, prior to that, in Terraform 11 and, and all versions previously, uh, all of your variables everywhere had to be enclosed in, uh, in this interpolation syntax. So you really had to type a lot of dollar signs and curly braces. So they did away with most of those now, and you can do um, straight variables inside your code without uh, escaping them with this interpolation syntax. Uh, so when we're talking about resources, there's basically four, there's four main types of uh, code block that you'll be defining, uh, and each one is specifically declared in its type uh, before you write it. Uh, so you might create a, so you've got resource blocks, which are the primary thing you'll be writing. And a resource block is something that will be deployed. So you might have a resource of a subnet or a resource of an EC2 server, and that would have all those properties that you assign to it um, that are defined by the provider. Uh, the other data block, or the other resource blocks that you'll find are internal to Terraform. So these are what's gonna affect your Terraform logic when it's running your module. So the first one is a variable block. And that's where you define an input variable that's going to take input data from for your deploy, and that's going to fill in data into your resource blocks that you defined. So the resort, the variable block, you define the data type, you can give it a description, um, and then there's output blocks, and the output blocks allow you to take uh, information generated by the API that tells you 
what are what is the data of the resource that you just deployed, and then you can output that data into other modules to be to be used by other um, other deploys. So you might say um, Amazon specifically uses unique IDs for all the resources that it creates. So you might have something that needs to know, well, what is the subnet ID that you created so that I can create a network interface inside that subnet? Well, if you have two different resource blocks, uh, how do you get the information from one to the other? You can define an output block, and that's going to say, this: the output of this resource, which is the ID, um, output it as this name, and then you can use that name and pass it into another resource block that needs that information. And then lastly, you've got data blocks, which um, can be very powerful and also um, cause major dependency help because you might have a module that needs to look up remote data. It's assuming that something's going to be there. Uh, and if it's not there, it sort of pukes sometimes. So if you say, find me all the subnets that exist in the account, and there's no subnets, uh, and you input that data into another module, well, it does a search that says, oh, I can't find anything, uh, and then it dies. So some of that is, again, improved in .12, but not completely resolved. Um, there's some very, you can get very big dependency webs very quickly, uh, depending on how you write your Terraform. So you have to be sort of cognizant of that. And um, yes? Uh, does Terraform do a DAG or something similar to do your dependency tree for you? So like a directed acrylic graph where you can say, here's my shit, this massive web of interconnected nodes, and you can figure out how to do it? Yes. It tries its best. It, uh, it has built-in dependency resolution, so it will, it will try its absolute hardest to uh, figure out what the optimum order to run things in. Um, most of that is, that's where knowing how to write your Terraform comes in handy, uh, where things like writing a data lookup as your input data to a resource is not necessarily best practice because that's not, um, that's not very explicit. Um, you don't have control over whether that data is going to be there. Whereas, if you had a module that was going to deploy that and you, you're going to run them at the same time, well, then you should just use the output of module A into module B, and then Terraform can see that explicit dependency and make that calculation. So it really comes down to writing your code well, and then that resolves most of the dependency issues that you'll run into. Is it a common thing, then, with modules to, uh, once you do the setup, or the teardown, I guess, um, you do like a verification to make sure that the state conforms with what your intention is? It should do most of that automatically. Um, so it's, uh, it's basically synchronous deployment. Um, so it, it deploys the resource, and then it gets confirmation from the API that it has been deployed correctly, that it was successful. Um, it does fail. It, it can fail um, sometimes. Yep, yep, some, some things you can run into. Not, you'll never get no feedback. At least I've never run into a scenario where you wouldn't know that something went wrong. Um, there are cases where uh, sometimes the API will time out uh, if it's a particularly long um, resource creation process. Some of, the, some of the AWS resources can take five plus minutes to deploy. And so there, the, they try and configure the timeouts on each API call to be appropriate to the resource. Uh, sometimes they miss them or they take longer than expected. And then your Terraform deploy will actually time out in the middle of trying to deploy a resource. And then it fails at that point in your script. And then you are sort of half-baked. And so you'll have a set of resources that are deployed. And then there's a bunch of resources that were going to get deployed that haven't been deployed yet. Um, but the advantage of Terraform is one of the features is its state tracking where it knows Every single thing that it deploys, it's, it knows about in its state file. And so if it gets halfway through deploy and then fails, well, the state that's committed is only whatever's actually deployed. And then so if you rerun that, it'll know what it needs to deploy still and what's already been deployed. So it's pretty good about solving any, um, any interruption issues. With the proviso that the state on, on metal or whatever is actually represented by what's internally stored in the state tracker. Yeah. Yeah, it does, um, it does touch every resource in the state file. So if you, when you run it again, uh, it will look at, okay, what's in my state file? Now, is that state file actually accurate? Uh, 
and it'll go and touch each resource in the state file to make sure that it's there. So you can actually, that's automatic, or is that something that you have to, uh, that you have to follow? No, that's built in. That's, that's automatic. It does it anytime you run it. It's basically checking its state file and then validating it against the environment. Can you have it do that on a periodic basis? Not as a built-in function. Uh, you would have to write the logic around it to do that, um, whether you cron it or you build a Jenkins pipeline with it, um, et cetera. Um, it has the capability of doing something like that, but not, not in its own self. Uh, so here's a code example. This might be my last slide. Um, so here's, here's all the blocks that I was talking about. So we've got um, your resource block. And so your resource, in this case, is um, an AWS VPC. So this, um, typically, they, they all follow sort of a, uh, a standard. And so the first half of your resource uh, type is going to be the provider. So in this case, it's the AWS provider. And then after the underscore is the actual type of resource that it's going to be. So in this case, it's a VPC. And then after that, we define a basically an object name for this specific resource. And what that allows you to do is uh, if you're deploying uh, multiple, say, AWS VPC resources, you give each one a unique name, and that's how you can refer to them in your code between them. So basically, it's sort of it looks like object-oriented programming, basically, where um, you've got an object type and then an object name of that. And then here you can see that I've got one property defined of this resource. So I'm saying um, the CIDR block uh, property is equal to this variable that I'm inputting. And that variable is called uh, VPC CIDR block. And it's prefixed by the var prefix. So anything, any variable is going to be prefixed by uh, var. And in Terraform 11, you would have seen that the interpolation syntax would be surrounding this this var string here because it didn't natively support just having a var declaration like that. And then so here's the corresponding variable block for this input variable here. So you can see we define a variable and then we say the name of the variable and we say it's a type string and the description is whatever we want it to be. That's just for our own usage. So you can see the type is string even though you might think well a cider block that's that's numbers, that's decimal numbers. but in the grand scheme of things, it's really just a string because you're not doing any network logic on it. Uh, you don't need it to be a number or a, a binary number or anything like that. You just basically have a string of decimal characters. And then your output might be a property of whatever you just deployed. So you would say output the my VPC. So here you're referring to this uh, just in your name. And then you might say, well, this is the ARN. And the ARN is the Amazon resource number, I think. And this is completely user defined. You can pick whatever you want for this. But this, so here's the value. And the value is going to be what data this output actually contains. So the value is going to be your object type, so AWS VPC. And then you're going to say, which object of this type is it? Well, it's my VPC. And then the attribute of this is going to be the dot ARN. So this. This part here you can find in the reference documents for each resource. So if you're deploying a VPC, you would go on the Terraform documentation. You would say, OK, what attributes are available once this resource is deployed? And then you can say, well, I'm going to need the R, and I'm going to need the ID. I'm going to need probably the CIDR block of that uh, resource. And then there might be a bunch of data that you really don't need. And so you don't need to output that from your module. Two questions. Uh, the variable, it doesn't have a value. I'm assuming that was just an omission, or would you, I guess, would it be correct to put value equals and then an actual hard coded string in the variable definition block there? Typically, no. So this is, this is basically, this is module code. So this is defining a reusable module, and I know I'm going to need a CIDR block. So I'm saying this module needs this variable. It's going to take this input data, but the actual data is defined separately. And then uh, another option that I didn't show is you can define a default. So you can say, well, if it's, uh, if it's bool I do it a lot with Booleans. Um, if you know most of the time you're not going to need something, you might set the default to false, uh, et cetera. And then the last one is the uh, data resource. So we define a data block. And then, again, we're just giving it uh, an object type. So this one is uh, your Terraform remote state. And then 
we're saying which, uh, this is a, a user-defined object name uh, that we're gonna use to reference this. And then I omitted uh, some of the extra code here um, for the specific uh, data object, but here you would define the properties of the data object that are gonna determine how it does the data lookup for the data you're looking for. I think that's the end of the slides. So I've got, um, I've got a couple of code examples that I'd like to show and possibly deploy. We will definitely run a plan. So let's see what we've got here. So let's start with, I'll close all these. Uh, so this is a little small. I'll see if I, maybe I can show you here. Does it make the directory tree bigger? No. no. Uh, let's go a little bigger. So. There we go. I don't have tree. So while we're waiting on that, I will touch a little bit on um, my IDE environment, uh, Department of Redundancy Department. Um, my IDE environment that I've got running here is actually a, a Docker container running on Windows. And the reason why I'm doing this is because if you've ever run into the um, multi-version Python hell, multi-version um, Ruby, PHP hell, whatever, um, Trying to carry a consistent development environment across multiple machines is a real pain in the butt, especially going between Windows and then Linux and then back again. Um, so the idea here with the Docker uh, development environment is basically you define a Docker file that contains all of what you'll need. Let me pull that up for you guys. What did you say the shortcut was? Control plus. Maybe the numeric keypad plus. Oh. Uh, Don't have one of those. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is my Docker file. And basically all it's doing is I'm using uh, a Fedora image and grabbing a couple of packages that I need. And then um, both Terragrunt and Terraform are available as pre-compiled binaries. Uh, they both, yeah, they both ship pre-compiled. So all you have to do is grab a copy of each of them and then you just throw them into your bin directory and they, they run without any dependencies. They're all um, just statically compiled. Uh, so by doing this, you just copy your Docker file from host to host and you, you build a new Docker image on each host. And by doing that, you have essentially a consistent development environment that automatically has TerraGrunt and Terraform pre-installed. And then if you keep all your code in a revision control, you just clone your repository into your into your Docker container, and you have all of your code to work on in your pre-configured development environment. Uh, so it works pretty well, and uh, I can share all that uh, for you guys to take a look at uh, later and maybe get started with it. Now, do I have tree? I have tree. So here's sort of the folder, folder structure we're looking at. Uh, so like I said, uh, we're basing this on a live folder and a modules folder at our top level. And then within those, uh, it's basically up to you how you want to organize your code. And so the way that uh, Gruntworks recommends is uh, within your live directory, uh, this is where you're actually going to represent the deployed code uh, with all the input data for your environment. So here we've got our top level environment name. So I'm calling my environment Terraform Demo. And then within that environment, we might be deploying to multiple regions. So here you can see that I've defined the CA Central 1 region, which is the only region we're currently deploying in. And then the next subfolder is gonna be our, um, basically our VPC name, which in this case corresponds to our environment name. Um, but you could have this set differently depending on how you want it. And then in each environment, you've got a basically a category of 
resources that you're deploying. Uh, so all of my demo uh, code is going to be networking related. So I've put it all in a networking folder. And then I've got the basically the module, the corresponding module name that I'm deploying. Um, and again, these can be whatever you want them to be, uh, but they they're easiest to read if you name it the same as your module, because then when you look at your code, when you look at your directory structure, you can say, okay, that's called Route 53 EXT. So I know that that's the module being deployed in this folder. If I need to know what the code is, I know where to look. And then I've got um, two VPCs uh, that I'll show you specifics. Um, I've got two different examples there that I wanna show you. And then you can see under uh, Route 53 EXT, we've got another subfolder for a domain name specifically, and then we've got the terragrunt.hcl file. And the big difference between uh, vanilla Terraform and uh, Terragrunt is, uh, especially with after version 12, they had to re, uh, reset how they uh, define the Terragrunt code inside your Terraform code because the latest, the version 12 of Terraform uh, stopped supporting inline code blocks that aren't compatible with Terraform. So you used to basically define your Terragrunt code in line with your Terraform code. And uh, that was supported up until that 12. And so now they, um, they rewrote it specifically to use the .hcl extension for Terragrunt. So if you're just running native Terraform, uh, your live folder would look slightly different. You wouldn't have everything named Terragrunt.hcl, um, but that's specific to Terragrunt. Um, and that's uh, that's how I've got it all set up. So to run to run this as it is, you have to be using Terra Grunt uh, because Terraform won't recognize these HCL files. But the uh, the module code is all just straight uh, Terraform. So if we look at our module structure, uh, it's not quite as deep as the live folder because we don't we don't divide it by environment or region. We're simply dividing it into categories of where we want things to be. So we've got our modules, and then we've got uh, all of our networking modules, and then we've got each individual module. And you can see here that each module is then divided into three files. We've got our main Terraform file, which is gonna contain all our resources. Then we've got outputs, which is gonna contain our outputs, and our vars file, which is gonna contain our variables. So that, again, that's not uh, required. You can define it all in a single TF file if you would like, uh, but this is, more explicit and it allows you to quickly switch between, uh, okay, I know my variables are all in here, I know my outputs are in here. Uh, so it keeps things organized and then these all get automatically pulled in um, by Terraform. It knows to look for any TF file in the directory that you're running it out of. Um, so you can name these whatever you want, uh, but these are the way to keep it organized uh, and sane. So let's take a look at what, are the, what these modules actually look like. So let's open up, let's start with our VPC module. And the coloring is gonna be a little bit off uh, because the Sublime syntax package for Terraform 11 worked great. Uh, after dot 12, they're still a little bit behind, um, but most of, the th most of the things are colored reasonably well. So let me increase our font size. Live and modules and subdirectories underneath that, and then all the rest of your structure. How was that? Like if you had one particular project, uh, you roll the live and modules for that project, and then all of your extra structure underneath that? Or do you just have live and modules for everything? Ideal, well, it depends on, it really depends on how you want to code your modules. Uh, I mean, it's just yeah, basically the idea here is that you write your modules to be abstract enough that they can be reused in different scenarios. It's not to say that you can bring them over to another place. Right, it, but here, I mean, you can, you can reference them multiple times in different spots. So you could create, by basically keeping them in a central location, you can just reference them anywhere you want uh, within your live folder. It's really just a matter of preference of how you want to maintain your code base. Uh, but either one would be valid. Uh, so why does Sublime not want to increase my font size? Come on. Uh, 
Restart. What's going on? Okay, it is just ignoring that. What's going on? Do I have to open this in Notepad? <laughs> oh, that's so weird. Uh, view. I don't, I guess I can open it in Vim. Does Terraform plug in with other, um, other devops -y tools like uh, Ansible, Genesis, or what have you? Uh, not, not directly, no. Um, you basically have to, there's no native connectivity between the two. Um, so you can, you could I use it. I, I haven't looked. I haven't looked whether you can deploy Ansible with a provider. Whether you could do that. There are some. There's definitely some. Um, definitely some providers that are not you know cloud platforms specifically. Um, but yeah, I haven't looked. Um, I haven't looked at. I think most people are doing the opposite. They're deploying Terraform with Ansible. So you might you might use Ansible to do a lot of the putting together Terraform in a certain way. Um, so let's open. I think that uh, that works enough. Okay, so here's uh, here's our um, here's our main.tf file inside. So we're calling this our VPC app module. So inside here, the first thing we're going to do in our module is we're going to define the provider, and our provider in this case is AWS, and then we're going to say the region for this provider is going to be our variable. So we're going to pass in the AWS region uh, for the provider as a variable. So this is this is what determines which region your code actually gets deployed to. So that's a function of the provider. And then this function here, allowed account ideas, account IDs, uh, is also a variable. And what that's saying basically is, uh, if somehow you provided this bad, uh, bad data and gave it the wrong account ID, and you had keys for both of those accounts, you don't actually accidentally deploy it in a different account than you meant to uh, and overwrite production when you were trying to deploy to prod. Uh, so these variables are, these ones specifically are actually uh, automatically populated by Terragrunt. Uh, that's one of the functions that it provides. Uh, so I'll show how that works in a second. And then here we've got our remote state. So Terraform supports a number of different state locations. Uh, and you can determine whether you want to store it on your local machine, which is unwise, or if you want to store it on a remote storage system. So in this case, it supports S3. So we're defining our back end here for our remote state as S3. So that's going to use Amazon S3. And then we're saying that the Terraform required version is greater than or equal to um, 0 0.12. So that's because all of our code is written for uh, version 12 or above. Uh, it's not compatible with any previous version, so there we want to explicitly define that. And if you try and run this with an older version of Terraform, it'll uh, print an error out saying this code is not compatible with this version of Terraform. Uh, now, normally in vanilla Terraform, this backend configuration for your remote state would be very long. You'd have to define uh, your S3 bucket, um, 
your path and all of that, your file name, but all that's automatically populated by Terragrunt. So again, once you have this set up, you just paste this into every module and Terragrunt just does its thing. And you don't even notice it. Um, so I'll show where that data is actually coming from uh, once I get into the live folder. So here we're actually defining a resource. So here's where we're actually going to deploy something for real. So here we've got our AWS VPC. We're calling it app VPC. So this is our object type. And this is our object name. And then these are the properties that we're going to provide data for when it creates this resource. So it's going to create a AWS VPC. And then it's going to define the CIDR block for that VPC that it creates as this variable. So we're going to input this data. We're going to give it the tenancy. And we're going to pass all of this data in as variables. So you're basically abstracting all of this, this resource. Uh, and you're basically just taking all the inputs that it's going to need. And you're defining them all as variables. And then here, here's our tags. So everything, almost every object you create in AWS uh, has tags, which are also key value pairs. And then here, we're using a couple of uh, internal or built-in Terraform functions to actually massage some of our input data and make it more usable. So here we've got uh, a merge function, which is going to take multiple maps, which are key value data objects. And we're going to take, uh, we're going to create uh, one map for ourselves. We're going to create it out of name and then a variable. And then we're going to merge that map with a variable map that we've defined um, as custom tags. So we're going to take this variable, and we're going to take this variable and this string, and we're going to merge it all together into a bunch of key pairs. So that's using some internal functions of Terraform where you can massage your data into a form that is uh, usable with uh, the resource blocks. And then you can see here we're defining a subnet object uh, called public subnet. And here you can see we're using the special, the special value here called count. So count is basically the precursor to the for loop. And it fills in um, some different functionality. Basically, instead of writing multiple resource blocks, if you need, uh, if you need say, two or four subnets uh, that are all going to be the same, then you wouldn't copy and paste your code block every time. You just give it a count. And you say, OK, how many of this resource am I going to create? And Terraform will automatically create uh, that number of those resources. And so what this allows us to do is uh, we could base the count on a variable. So here we're saying uh, the number of, of availability zones, because each subnet is specific to an availability zone. Um, that's sort of um, AWS specific redundancy stuff. And then what we're going to do here is we're actually going to take advantage of this count. And similar to what we would do in a for loop is when we say, OK, well, we're creating one for each availability zone. But how do we know which availability zone it's actually going to get created in? Because we want it to be in both of them. So then we're going to say, we're going to specify, well, here's the input to say what availability zone we're getting created in. So we're going to say, use a data lookup and ask AWS what are the availability zones that I can create something in? Because we don't want to hard code those. We just want to put them in depending on where we're deploying. Uh, so then this has got a couple of properties to it, which I'll cover in a minute. And then we've got this. So this is basically just addressing from an array. So we're treating this. So this is returning a list object, which is an array. And then the index that we're going to use for that array is actually built into this count object. So this is a special little. Uh, operator that you get uh, on any object that you have the count defined. So when you're deploying a resource with a count, well, resource number zero is going to get uh, array index zero from this list. And then the second one that it creates is going to be array index one. So count is going to be one. And then your uh, array index is going to pull from one. So we're making the assumption that there's two of them in this case. And then we're going to create two of them. And then we're going to use both availability zones in that. And we're going to use that count index to pull both of those from that list. Is that native Terraform or Terraform? That's Terraform. Yeah. Everything, um, yeah, everything at this point forward is going to be just native Terraform in these modules. Uh, and then. So we create an AWS subnet, and if you're familiar with that, 
the subnet is created inside your VPC. So this is where we get into dependencies. You can't create an AWS subnet if you don't have a VPC to create them in. Uh, and so in this case, they're defined um, sequentially in your file, but you don't have to do that. You can say, you could deploy or define this resource block for the subnet. You could put that earlier in your file than the VPC. And the reason that Terraform is gonna figure out that that's a dependency is because you still have to tell that subnet what VPC it's getting created in. So that's what we're doing here is the VPC ID input of this AWS subnet object, we're gonna say, use the output, use the attribute of the resource that we've already deployed. So we're created above, we created AWS VPC, app VPC, and then we want the ID attribute of that resource that we created, and we're gonna use that as the input to the VPC ID. So we don't have to, uh, we don't have to output anything from this, we know that it's gonna get created, and then we know which attribute to reference for it. And because these are in the same module, uh, this is accessible to all other resources in the module. You can look up the attributes of the other objects that are created in there. So once you've defined that, uh, Terraform will look at that and it will recognize that, oh, this resource is dependent on output data from another resource. So I can't deploy this resource until that other resource is created. Uh, and so this is a very explicit dependency. You would never run into an issue with this where Terraform wouldn't recognize that it's dependent because it's explicitly within the same module and it's explicitly um, looking at output data. It would absolutely know that it has to deploy one before it can deploy the other. And then here we're using another uh, input function, uh, Terraform function, we're using the format option and this lets us um, format strings. And so here we're taking a couple of different uh, pieces of data and we're combining them all together uh, into a single string that we're gonna give to the name, the name tag that we apply to it. So what we're doing here is basically our VPC name that we're gonna use uh, for the VPC. We're also gonna name our subnets after that. And then we're gonna add in the type of subnet that we're creating. In this case, we're calling it a public subnet. And then we're gonna give it the um, count.index. So if you create two uh, public subnets, uh, each one of those is gonna have an index, and then we assign that to the actual name that it uh, applies to it. So you'll have subnet zero, subnet one, et cetera, forever how many it creates. Uh, and here we've done the same thing. We've done another subnet, except this one is private. Uh, anything of note there? Not really, you can see that we've just changed this here. Um, and we are, uh, actually I should have pulled out that one line, but that's okay. Of the, uh, this map public IP on launch should not be in there because we would never wanna do that on a private subnet, but uh, that's okay. And then lastly in this module, uh, we've got our data object that we're gonna look up. So these data objects are available in the Terraform documentation and depending on what provider you're using will define uh, what data lookups are available to you to look up. So in this case, we want the availability zones that are available to us uh, in this region that we're working on. So because we set the provider to a certain region, this is gonna be a region specific data lookup. And then what we're looking up there is we're saying the data type that we're looking for is AWS availability zones and we're gonna call our object AZs and we want them to be in the state of available. So there, there we're hard coding an input variable. So you could uh, make that a variable and you could say, well, I might wanna search for a unavailable uh, availability zone for one reason or another. Uh, but in this case, we know we want it to be available. So we just hard code that to a variable or to a value. So what does all that look like uh, to actually deploy? Well, let's go over to the to the live folder for this. So this was the VPC app module. And so we will go to our corresponding live folder in our Terraform demo environment. We're in the CA Central One region and our VPC name is Terraform demo. And then we're going to go into networking and VPC app. So inside here, you can see we just have this one file called uh, terragrant.hcl. And that is going to contain all of our input data to that module that we were just looking at. So if we look at this, um, 
Here you'll see a couple of uh, Terragrunt specific functions. And the first one of these is right at the top, which you can just barely see. Oh, that's, that's not better. Any case, um, so here we're defining the uh, source that this live deployment is actually going to use. So here you're saying all of this input data needs to be used with a module. What's the source of that module? And so we're saying we're using this uh, Terragrunt function called find in parent fol folders. And that's, uh, I'll explain that a little more in a second. Basically, it's allowing you to go up the folder chain uh, to a certain point, and then from that point downward, uh, it knows you know that there's a set tree, basically, uh, to the module that you're looking for, and that's what we're doing here. So basically, uh, it's looking for the top level HCL file, which I'll show uh, in a second, and then we want to go three layers up, and then we want to go back down. So this is basically getting us up to that root level directory, and then we're going to go into modules, networking, and then VPC uh, app. Yeah. So this is saying all of this input data is going to go into this module, and then it's going to automatically pull in that module when you run this to uh, deploy with. And then it's got the include option. Again, this is a, um, I can't remember if this is Terragrunt or, no, I think this is just Terraform. So this include function is just um, native Terraform. And what it's doing is similar idea. It's going up your folder tree, and it's looking for any other HCL files, and it's going to basically source in those variables. So you can have essentially global variables at the top level, and then you've got deployment-specific variables in this folder. And I'll show you that too in a sec. And then here we've got our inputs defined for our uh, deployment of this module. So as far as uh, environment documentation, here is all the data for your environment. So if you want to know, well, what's the CIDR block of my VPC? Well, it's right there. And if you want to know, well, how many availability zones am I deployed to? Well, it's right there. Uh, what's my tenancy? Right there. So all of the data that actually matters, essentially, is right here. And then so you can define, so here's our map that we define. You can see here we've got um, our key value pairs uh, of each one. So I've defined a couple different tags uh, that we would use to search for different, mod different resources that we've deployed. Um, we might use a data lookup to search by tags for that. And then here we're defining our um, subnet lists or our subnet addresses. And we're saying here I'm defining the third octet, which I've done through the module. And so here I'm defining the subnet, the public subnets are going to be, um, the third octet is going to be 0, 1, and then 2, 3 for, uh, for app subnets. So what does that look like if we actually try and deploy it? Let's take a look. So every, the idea with Terragrunt is that it maps one-to-one -one with Terraform. So every command that you run with Terragrunt, you could, in theory, run with Terraform. Uh, and they switch back and forth. So if you know how to do it in Terraform, you know the command to do it in Terragrunt and vice versa. So if we run a uh, Terragrunt plan, it's going to do a couple of different things. It's going to copy. What it's going to do is it's going to take that module that we put in the source. It's going to copy that into a temporary directory, and it's going to run off of that. So even if uh, somebody was actively changing the module file while you were trying to deploy something, which is a terrible idea, don't do that, um, it's, going to, it's going to pull in a copy, uh, and then it's going to be in a static state while it does its uh, full deploy. So you can see it's doing a couple of things. Uh, the first that it's going to do is uh, above. Uh, I'll wait till this finishes. Basically, what it's doing is the first thing it's going to do is it's going to go out to AWS and it's going to look for its remote state directory uh, and it's going to create that if it doesn't exist already. And then it's going to uh, get ready to actually save the state file when it's ready to do that. So the command that I just ran was called the plan. So plan is like a dry run. It doesn't actually execute anything. It just looks at your environment, all the resources that you've defined, and says, okay, what am I actually going to do when you're ready to do this? And this is extremely useful because most of the time you probably won't get it right on the first time. Um, I know that there's, sometimes there's little intricacies or you get your uh, dependencies wrong a little bit and uh, you end up passing in wrong data and then it, uh, it works up. So it's good to always run a plan and then do a sanity check on all your data and make sure that um, you're actually giving it the data that you thought you were. So what it's going to do here is it's going to list all the resources that it's going to deploy into your environment. Um, 
And you can see it's showing all of the attributes of those resources. And you'll notice a lot of these say known after apply. That's because those are all resource identifiers that haven't been created yet. So once you create the resource in Amazon, then all of those unique identifiers are then populated and it can tell you what those are. So things like um, the ARN and the ID um, and um, the uh, owner ID and all these, uh, it's not gonna actually know those until it does the deploy. And that's where the dependency resolution comes in because you might need to know the ID of this subnet before you do something else with it. So it's got to go and create that subnet in AWS. Then it's got to query that resource, find out what the attributes of it actually are, and then it can pass those into another resource that needs to know what that object is. And then here you can see, uh, if you recall, we were deploying multiple subnets. So here you can see we've got um, subnet zero, and here we've got uh, subnet one for our app subnet. And you can see that the CIDR block is defined as we wanted it to be. We've got uh, .2 and .3. And then we've got our public subnets. And then we've got our actual VPC. And the majority of this is really not known at the beginning, but that's okay because there's really only a couple of p key pieces of information that we need to supply at the beginning. We need the CIDR block. We need uh, the tendency, things like that, and we need our tags. So if we've looked all this over and we say, okay, yeah, that all looks good, I'm ready to go, uh, we can then do a uh, Terragrunt apply. It's basically gonna do the exact same thing over again. Uh, it's gonna do another plan ahead of time so that you're absolutely sure. Uh, if, you, if you like to live very dangerously, you can just run an apply and read that plan and then click yes. Um, I always do a plan first just because I don't like to accidentally click yes after missing something and then, uh, then you have to go back and destroy it all. So we glance all this over, we say, yeah, I think that's all good. And then, do you want to proceed? Type yes, so we want to say yes. Now it's going to go out and make things happen, yes. So a big part when I'm planning stuff in my own frugal world, I like to see like the Amazon price calculation? Yeah. Is that built into the plan in any <laughs> Not that I know of. No, I haven't seen that at all. That would be handy to have though if it would go out and say, yeah, this resource is going to cost you 10 cents an hour. But uh, no, I, as far as I know, no one's done that yet. And here it is. So here is our outputs. Now these outputs uh, are not necessarily going to be here, and these are all things that we've defined in our module. Uh, if we were to go back into our module and look at our outputs file, uh, you could see all of these that I've defined. So one of the things that I defined was um, our app subnet ARNs. So we're going to output both of those. So these are the actual ARNs that were created by Amazon. Here's our subnet IDs. Um, so once all of this output data is then put into what's called the remote state file in this case. So we've configured uh, Terraform to use what's called remote state, and that's gonna put all of that data into an S3 bucket in a state file, and it's gonna track all of these IDs in it, and if any of these change, then it's gonna be able to detect that because it knows what should be there. Uh, so let's, uh, let's see if we can log into AWS. And let's see what we did. Okay, so we're in the uh, CA Central region. Now let's go take a look at our VPC that we created. So if we go into our VPCs. So here you can see we've got a VPC called Terraform Demo VPC. And it's created with the 
uh, 10.130.0.0 uh, cider there. And here's the uh, unique ID that we got in our output. And then if we look at the uh, subnets for each of those, you can see that we have uh, four subnets created here. And we've got uh, app one and two, or app uh, zero and one, and uh, public zero and one as well. So all of that was automatically created with Terraform. And then if we uh, say, let's delete one of these subnets and let's see what happens. Yes, I want to delete it. So what's going to happen now is we're going to go back. And we're going to run another plan. And even though that state file still has all of those subnets uh, recorded in it as if nothing has changed, uh, what it's going to do is, here you can see refreshing Terraform state in memory. So what it's going to do is it's going to look at its state file, and then it's going to go and touch every single one of those resources that it just created, and it's going to check the status of them to make sure that they're still there. So you can see, oh, it outputs something. So it says, oh, I looked at my state file, and something that I expected to be there isn't there, so obviously I need to create it again. So here it's it knows which subnet is missing. It knows which data is missing. So it's going to now redeploy that subnet as if it was always there. Um, so that's that's basically how you could do uh, compliance. Is there is no compliance option or feature where it it'll automatically check. But all you're basically doing is running a Terraform plan and then checking if there are deviations from what you've deployed. So, yeah. Is it standard then with Terraform just to have that run periodically? It can be, yeah. Um, you can do things like um, there, there's ways to put it into a, a pipeline, and then uh, your pipeline is just automatically checking every once in a while and uh, making sure there's no outstanding deploys. So, oh, where did I go? Is it common to use a pre-processing language to generate, in this case, like the other files, but like TF files? Is that common these days? I don't think so. Not that I've seen. Okay. I'm guessing that the whole idea is that you already have that for the plate where necessary, even if you don't, you just make it. Yeah, once you've written it, it's pretty much, hopefully it's reusable to the point where um, you don't need to do a lot of uh, reinventing the wheel for every time you need to do something a tiny bit different. Uh, so that's great. We've deployed one module. Uh, now, what if we want to deploy multiple modules at the same time? Um, obviously, um, as I showed with that um, module dependency lookup where you can refer to data uh, from one object to another, um, you don't want to put all of your resources in a single module just so that they can look look up the data from each other because um, it would get very unwieldy and you can't actually divide them into any useful functions. So what we can do is we can actually create what's essentially a, a parent module and Terraform doesn't, doesn't really have a name for this yet as far as I can tell, uh, but they do have the function and the function is you can define a module within a module and you can basically just keep going as far down as you want and, Modules can call modules, can call modules. So I've, called, I've created one here called VPC. And if we go inside uh, VPC, or not here, if we go to uh, modules, networking, VPC. So here you can see it starts off exactly the same. We've just copy and pasted our provider information. Um, our Terraform backend is the same. Are there inheritance relationships? Sort of. Uh, not really. It's mostly just manually redefining everything. Um, so here's a perfect example. Uh, so we want to deploy, we have a module here, a parent module, and we're going to say there's two child modules of this module that are both going to get deployed at the same time. So our first module, we're going to call it module VPC, and then we're going to say the source of this module is actually the VPC app module, which is basically right beside me in, in this directory. And what we've done here basically is, unfortunately, we've had to basically redefine all of our variables. So every time you add a layer of module, you also add 
basically completely redefining your variables. And this can be good if you don't like how the variables are named in a child module. You can completely rename them in your parent module, and then you just perform the translation here. So here I've basically copied them one to one. So what this means is that all of the variables that I defined in the VPC app module, I then have to redefine in this module, and then I'm basically just assigning them one to one. So I'm saying the AWS region variable of VPC app is going to be equal to this module's var dot AWS region, and same with all of these other variables. So you're just passing them into one to one, but you can also do uh, modifications to those variables if you need to, depending on how you're handling your data. And the same is true with the outputs. Unfortunately, if you have a child module that outputs certain data object or data attributes that you need you then have to output those again from your parent module if they need to be accessed somewhere else. So it is a bit of duplication, but it does allow you to then um, shrink your modules into more uh, bite-sized Lego blocks so that you can uh, move them around more easily and they don't get uh, too monolithic. I noticed earlier that you did have an include directive for, I think that was Terraform code. Yes, that's in the uh, live directory. Yeah, and I will show you that again. Typically, you uh, I typically you wouldn't do an include in a module definition. You no, your your um, the include is for uh, input variables. So if you have input variables from a higher level file that you want to include in a deploy, then you can include those um, variable definitions. But the actual modules themselves don't include code from other modules. So here we've got a second module defined inside our VPC module. So we're deploying the VPC out of the VPC app module. And then we might also want a DHCP option set to go with that. But we don't want to put those all in one big module. We want to have those independent of one another. So we write them separately, and then we combine them in this module together. And what that allows us to do is we can say here, um, right here, the DHCP option set needs to know the VPC ID and the VPC name that it's going to be uh, associated with. And to do that, we need to, when we're running them in the same parent module, we can then refer to them by their module. So here the module that we defined above was called VPC. And then we can define the output, we can use the output attributes of that parent module uh, into this other module here. Uh, so the other way you could do this is you could do a data lookup instead if you didn't want to create a parent module on top of these. But that's where you're going to run into dependency issues where if you run them out of order, then it doesn't know the dependency chain properly and they can fight with each other. So this is an explicit way of separating them into small modules, but at the same time you can still maintain that uh, proper dependency chain where it's going to be able to calculate what, what order to, ca to create things in. So let's, uh, let's go back to our live folder and I'll show you what that include is all about. So if we look at, so here's our environment folder and this is basically the top level of the teragrant.hcl files that you're gonna define. So if we look in here, you can see that I've created a teragrant.hcl file at the, basically the top level of this environment. So if we look inside this teragrant, this is where all of our uh, environment specific data, input data is gonna be that we know we're gonna need in every single deploy that we do within this environment. We know we're gonna need this data. So we're gonna put it at the top level and then it's Teragrunt that allows us basically to import that module or that um, HCL file as input data across all of our sub, uh, sub modules. So what we're saying here is, so here we're defining the remote state uh, for Terraform, and this is a Terragrunt feature, but it's using, but it's inputting data into Terraform. So normally, all of this, uh, all of this backend con configuration would have to be in every single live full, uh, live uh, file that you created. And so you know it's going to be the same because you're deploying to the same account, the same spot every time. And so what this allows you to do is Terragrunt is smart enough just to 
take this input data and put it in the right spot every time you run your um, submodules. And so here we're using, um, this is a Terra Grunt feature. And so it's going to populate this path uh, to put your uh, Terraform remote state. And then it's going to define where your uh, Terraform remote state is actually going to end up. We're also defining a lock table, which is another Terra Grunt feature that Terraform 12 pretty much has the equivalent feature of, but it was, prior to that, it was specific to Terra Grunt. And what that lets you do is there's a DynamoDB table in AWS, and it basically creates a lock file. And what that does is if two people try and deploy to the same spot at the same time uh, that are going to collide, it'll basically detect that it's locked. And so you won't have, if you have multiple people working in, in an environment, you won't have them colliding and trying to deploy on top of each other at the same time. And then here we've got input variables that we know we're going to need uh, across that are specific to the account. So we've got our account ID, our environment name, our region. And so these are going to get automatically uh, included through that include statement. And those are variables that we're going to need in every case. So we define them here. So this is what that um, path relative to include is actually calculating, is it's going to go wherever you run Terragrunt, it's going to go all the way up the folder chain until it finds this very first Terragrunt.hcl file. And it's going to input that as a variable that you can then use to uh, create folder paths with. So I think that's how are we for time. Is anyone using this underneath the service manager, like the Ubuntu tools or whatever? I don't know of any that are, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody had built a further abstraction layer on top of it to do stuff. Well, I mean, just to, that wouldn't really be abstracting the configuration, but it could potentially allow you to manage things in a, in a slightly smoother way. Yeah, I haven't personally encountered it, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so I think that's all I have to show you guys. Um, any more specific questions? Anything I didn't show you that you'd like to see more of? Resources. Right. Let's show you that. So we created all these resources, and now how do we get rid of them? Well, Terraform obviously knows that all these resources exist, so we can tell Terraform just to get rid of them all. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so if we go into, we have to go back to our deploy folder, which is in uh, here. So here we're going to run the destroy command. And the destroy command is going to go through your whole state file. And it's going to find all the resources that still exist. And then it's going to just delete them. So if we run that, it's going to go through. So say I have this application that's currently running, and I have it running. So let's say I have it on Terraform. Uh, is there a mechanism to spin up new resources, do something, and then tear down the old ones? Not natively in Terraform, no. What you would, you'd basically have to do parallel deployment, most likely. And you would just deploy a new set of resources and then destroy the old ones. Okay, so deploy a new one, flip a load balancer, and then you do this, this board. Okay. Yep. But potentially, um, if you already have deployed, you alter your build, and then on the plan, it will show you the diff between what's live and what you're planning on. Uh, yes, there will be um, making changes to your infrastructure through Terraform is possible, and most of the time, it depends on the AWS capabilities, you can do in place changes. Um, which I could also show you. Um, yeah, things like that. One problem is not all AWS resources support in place uh, property changes. Uh, so sometimes it involves de destroying and then recreating. And so Terraform will de detect that automatically, but there is a window there where you have no resources, where resource A with value A uh, is destroyed and then it deploys resource B with value B but in the middle there, there was a section of time where you had nothing. So it doesn't, it doesn't 
doing a change with Terraform uh, does not do a seamless transition. You'd have to do the parallelization yourself. Uh, so here it's saying, so we've run the destroy, and now it's going to show us all of our resources that we've got uh, deployed. And it's going to say, okay, these are all the things that are going to get destroyed. So we say, yes, we want to destroy those. And then it's going to go and make all the API calls that we need to then destroy those. There you go, resources for destroyed. And so if you'll recall, originally we deployed five resources, but I went and deleted one. And so it already, it went through and it knew, oh, well, that resource is already missing, so I don't even need to delete it. I just need to delete all of the remaining resources that are there. And then it's going to update the state file to say, well, now there's nothing. So I've gone, I've done a destroy, and I haven't been selective. I've just destroyed everything that was in the deploy, and so now it's going to mark the state file as empty, and it knows that it has no resources deployed. But you still have storage in that S3 bucket. Yes, the, the Terraform... Uh, state S3 and the DynamoDB table locks are basically permanent. Um, it doesn't ever clean those up unless you specifically go in and manually delete them. Um, and that's essentially on purpose because once you start an environment with Terraform, chances are you're always going to have at least something there. Um, so it doesn't completely erase itself from the face of the earth when you run a destroy. <laughs> Is there a mechanism like uh, audit logs for running this stuff. Does it keep a log along with state as to what it was doing all the time? Or is it just simply current state that saves it um, I'm actually not sure about that. Um, I assume you could log the standard output of the application. So it would you would have a log of all the deploys that have happened. Um, but as far as the state history, um, it would only have current current state information. Uh, you could also turn on S3 versioning, and then you could look at um, all the versions of the state file that have been there um, to go through. And you you would literally see, in theory, every infrastructure state that ever existed uh, by doing that. So, any other questions? Are there any systems to set up like a, a webhook on like your uh, your revision system? Like on a push to master? Yep. Yeah, that's up to your pipeline, basically. So you could, um, if you had a pipeline that was automatically, that was had a webhook into Git, um, you would have to write the logic to do the Terraform deploy. Um, but yeah, you could, if you set up your pipeline, you could do a commit to Git, um, pipeline detects the change, uh, and then automatically runs the Terraform plan and apply. So would that be running like your Docker environment? You'd make a copy of that on your CI server? You could do it that way, yeah. You could just configure your your build environment manually. Uh, it would be really be up to you and your pipeline scenario. What do you like about Terraform or what do you dislike about Terraform? Um, I, like, I like, actually, I like the language. Um, HCL is pretty easy to read and understand. Um, and once you get used to it, um, you can bang it out really quickly. So um, I looked at, I initially looked at CloudFormation and it's very verbose, uh, even though it's YAML. So it's hard to read and it's verbose. Um, Terraform is quite readable, I think, and also uh, pretty easy to type. So I think it, as far as efficiency goes, I like it quite a bit. Um, Yes, yeah, but at least it's all the same language. If you have to bounce between CloudFormation and Azure and Google Cloud, whatever language, uh, at least here you're you're running the same language in each one. Uh, all your variables and outputs are going to look the same. It's just the actual resource names that are going to be different. Uh, what do I dislike about it? Um, probably the probably the lack of uh, lack of logic. Um, it has some, but. Sometimes it feels like, man, I wish I was just doing this in Python and making API calls because mm -hmm. at a certain point, um, it would just be easier to do the logic that way. But I haven't run into too many situations like that. If only they had a way of breaking up the code or something. They do have uh, an option called, it's a provider, uh, and the provider is called local exec. And so the local exec provider can literally run any command on your command line. So if you... If you wanted to run bash, you could run bash. You could actually, 
Um, you could you could do some very hacky things for input calculating input data with the local exact provider if you really wanted to. But then you would have to parse the output from your from local. Yes. Provider. Yep. <laughs> How annoying was it when they went from eleven to twelve that you had to rewrite everything? Um, not too bad, actually. It wasn't huge logic changes. It was just some formatting changes, mostly. Um, they also fixed um, a couple of big issues with the dependency resolution. So overall, it was net positive and definitely we were all, everybody on the team was waiting for 12, like, okay, come on, let's go. Uh, we've got stuff literally sitting and waiting on dot 12 to come out before we could deploy it. So overall, it was positive. Anyone else? No? Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks,